So um, yeah, this is my um, improving web vulnerability scanning talk. Um, yeah, it is not about memory corruption. It is not about buffer overflows. Um, it's about web scanning, but um, about cool web scanning. And um, yeah, so so we should probably um, start with uh, the reasons for this talk because um, obviously there are like a hundred um, tools for penetration testing uh, web applications out there already. Um, I mean the we know Skipfish, we know a little bit of Nessus, we know the W3AF, uh, SQL map, a lot of tools, a lot of good tools. And um, so the actual reason for this talk is not to build a new tool that um, does exactly the same thing as all the others do. The reason for this talk is to improve all the other tools and to build a new tool that um, acts like a proof of concept for, for the strategy that I'm going to present now. And yeah, so, so that's, uh, this talk is all about um, web applications and um, how the web changed in the last few years and um, obviously we're not dealing with um, static websites anymore with, you know, um, a couple of um, static sites with some links and some forms and maybe some, I don't know, Java applets. We're still dealing with Java applets but um, Th that's a lot of new stuff. There are WebSockets, WebGL, all that stuff. So, 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 um, the reason for the talk is simply that all the tools that are out there right now are sort of, um, using HTTP libraries and HTTP parsers to handle web content that they get through a TCP socket. And, um, I had the impression that um, there is a better way to to solve the problem, and yeah, so, so that's the reason for the talk. And yeah, um, who am I? Um, it's my first year at DevCon. Um, it's my first talk. Um, I'm Dan. I do some software development. I did some KVM stuff in the kernel space, um, and I'm trying to build a startup. Um, yeah, so so. That's me. That's why I'm interested in that stuff and why I want to improve that stuff. So um, the structure of the talk is primarily really simple. I'm going to talk about the problems of um, web scanning. How I, at least from my point of view, solved them. I'm going to try to prove it with some demos. And um, yeah, when you want to switch over to the um, Metasploit and Kinect talk, then um, after the demo is a really good time for that because then I'm simply going to walk through a lot of code. Yeah, so that's it. And um, how many of you guys are penetration testers or actually worked in that space? Could you raise your hands? I thought so. So a lot of you. So um, yeah, you know the tools out there, you know what they do, you know how um, automated they are. And um, you also know that um, during a penetration test um, we can't really rely on one tool as the final and the only solution for web apps because for example if you use the W3F framework to penetration test a website, um, it is very likely to happen that some encoding errors occur. And if you use SQL map to exploit a SQL injection, it is very likely that that process fails. So what we do is we build tool chains. And we, we build really large tool chains and there's nothing wrong with that but um, I had the impression that we build tool chains with a lot of web scanners and um, all the web scanners have the same problem. So in the end, we have ten tools that fire the exact same HTTP requests against a web server and um, we don't have any benefit from that extra traffic. And um, yeah, so that's sort of my feeling of the penetration test as pain. Um, you start a tool against a website, watch the process, you have no idea what happens in the, in the background except um, that some injection attacks happen and some crawling and, and you know, looking for backup files and I don't know. 
but it's it's like a black box in the end, and you can only hope that one scanner finds more vulnerabilities than the other scanners. So yeah, um, I think yeah, um, I, I just try to to handle that in a better way, a more reliable way, because in web scanning, it all comes down to reliability in the end. So so let's let's start with Skipfish and. I want to say um, Skipfish is a perfectly great tool. I mean, the code is great, it's super modular, it's super plain C. Really cool. But if you use it against JavaScript rich applications or a website with, um, um, you know, Flash, it's completely useless. It's, it's great for really static websites. If it, it's perfect if you want to find hidden backups and or if you want to DDoS a, a web server, it, it's perfect. But um, you know, to authenticate and and do web sockets and and attack web sockets, it's more or less useless. And um, the reason for that is it's based on an HTTP library. And I want to say again, it's it's a great tool. I mean, the guy even built a, a own HTTP library in C, and it's cool. So. It's a great tool, but um, I think we have a lot of HTTP fuzzers out there already, and we really don't want to attack HTTP even more because we all know HTTP. We we know how the requests look like. We know how, re the, how the responses look like. But um, there's an additional logical layer of, of vulnerabilities and of features and websites, and you know. Um, if if you if you um if the if the core of your scanner is HTTP and the website is based on Flash, you get a lot of binary content and um your HTML library is going to try to parse that content and it's going to fail because it's no HTML. And so so that's just not going to work. And um a, th a second example for that problem is the W3F. Perfectly modular, perfectly, um, yeah, it's Python code, it's, it's really cool plugins, really cool stuff, but um, the, the core of the W3F is a HTTP library. In fact, it's, it's um, just a URL lib from Python with an additional, um, you know, security layer. So um, it's the same problem in the very end. And the, the uh, third example is a great tool as well. SQL map, we all know it, we all love it for, for SQL injections. Um, but when you try to um, actually, you know, use the internal heuristics of SQL map to find some forms on a website and to, to perform injections against these HTML forms, it is likely to happen that the internal HTML parser of SQL map is going to fail. And I mean, that's okay because it's as security guys, it's not really our job to write good HTML parsers and to create good HTTP libs. But um, if you're a penetration tester and you, you run SQL map against a website and SQL map says the HTML is broken, it's, it's sort of not the result that we expected because we're not interested in that. And um, when you start your Firefox or Chrome or your burp suit or whatever afterwards and try to inject into that form manually, you will recognize it works. And um, the HTML is still broken and um, it's still a really broken website and it may not look nice, but your, your browser renders the form, it, you, you can use the web elements, you, you see the input fields and you can simply fire your requests. So um, yeah, so, so, so the sum up of all that um, stuff is we have a lot of tools. All the tools are based on HTTP libraries and have some HTML parsers in them. They also have some, um, you know, regular expressions to extract some URLs out of JavaScript. Maybe they have even readers for um, flash files. But uh, as we have seen with the browser example, there is a better way to solve the problem. And uh, the solution is 
from my point of view because it is incredibly hard to extract information from a Turing complete language like JavaScript. It is incredibly hard to handle all the broken HTML and web stuff. Um, so, so the solution is from my point of view to simply use a web browser. So I jumped over a couple of slides but I wanted to, to come to that final point very quickly because the, the fundamental um, reason for this talk is simply and that's really simple. I created a Python web scanner and replaced the actual, the actually, you know, the core component that we know from all the scanners out there. I replaced that with a web browser. I took WebKit. I, I used the PySide project to get the web browser in there and um, I don't build my HTTP request and all that stuff myself. I simply use the web browser. I have full access to it. I modified WebKit a little bit. I patched it. I, I can fire JavaScript events and all that stuff. So, um, yeah. So, I've talked a lot about HTTP libraries and, and all that stuff now, but um, it all comes down to this whole talk comes down to the web browser that I put in the middle of my scanner. And um, yeah, I mean there are some other issues that we have with web scanning. For example, URLs used to look like the example that is on the slide up there. You know, um, slash news, slash question mark and some pair of whatever. And then the search engine optimization guys came and they um, felt good with completely different URLs and they completely ignored the RFCs, they completely ignored everything and it's not bad. The URLs look nicer in fact but yeah, we as scanner developers have no chance to actually extract dynamic parts of that URL and to you know, um, it's, it's simply impossible to, to tell which part of a URL today is dynamic, injectable or, you know, whatever. It's simply impossible. So, um, putting all the problems of vulnerability scanning together looks like that. We can't handle JavaScript, we can't handle Flash, we have problems with authentication. We have web firewalls out there, um, and um, all of a sudden, we also have business logics, we have e commerce systems, and all that stuff. So, um, now I come back to my, my little browser approach. It, that does not solve all the problems, but it is a good start because it eliminates most of the problems. It eliminates the JavaScript problem, it eliminates the Flash problem. There are still some Java applets out there, so, so. If we want to support that, that is eliminated as well. And um, yeah, so so from there we, we can start addressing a lot of different problems and we can start to build actually better tools because we don't have to care about all the stuff that we don't like. We don't have to care about redirects, about some HTML stuff, all that, all that stuff is, is suddenly gone because the web browser will take care of it. And um, yeah, so, so um, I actually put a little example scanner into the slides. It's, it's just Python. Um, yeah, um, the code simply shows um, Python spawning a browser instance, loading Google.com, crawling Google.com, logging into Google.com killing the browser instance again and starting the fuzzing. And as you can see, the whole scanner has seven lines of code. And um, of course, the actual scanner that I'm going to release today is larger, but um, the concept and the design of the scanner is exactly um, shown with that code. So, so the follow up is um, if we want to build uh, penetration testing tools for the web that are more reliable and actually more useful to, to attack 
today's web applications. You know, not the web ten, that, that was online 10 years ago with um, where the most dynamic um, element was a, uh, you know, form and a post request. Then, w then we actually need to start um, actually attacking web content and not HTTP. And um, so th that's kind of what I um, wanted to achieve with the um, included web browser. And um, yeah, so as I said before, I did not want to build a new tool and a new solution for everything, but I also wanted to improve the existing solutions because we have great tools for a lot of different purposes already. We have SQL map, we have the W3F, we have Skipfish, we have all those tools. And the only process that fails in all those tools is discovery. So when this process and all those tools is actually replaced by a process that works and that works better than the existing process. We can still use all those tools and they are great as I said. But we can also put a lot of pressure off the scanner developers because now suddenly they have actual, they have actually time to focus on security and not on, you know, HTML anymore, and that's that's kind of good. That, that's good. For I think that's a um, good um, solution for the really um, annoying problems that come with uh, the web today. So um, th the second and probably more interesting part of that talk is not about simply putting a browser engine into a Python scripting, but it's about authentication. And the authentication process that I implemented is um, still relying on the browser engine and still relying on the rendering and JavaScript ex execution. But um, it solves a different problem. And the problem it solves is not HTTP, you know, HTTP basic that is supported by every HTTP library and other stuff. But um, we have a lot of different authentication schemes on the web. And they all look like that, for example. You know, um, just some forms, an email address, a username, and um, what I try to do is to fingerprint these um, authentication schemes. And um, I actually, what I, what I learned is um, there are three fingerprintable elements in today's web authentication. It's as this slide shows, um, there are always two visible text fields. The first one is, you know, for some kind of username or, a, or an email address. The second one is for a password. And if you have a HTTP library based scanner, the problem is that the scanner is actually blind. It sees a lot of HTML content, a lot of text, but it's hard to tell which of those text fields is actually used for the username and which one for the password and which one for, I don't know, the description of your WordPress comment. So when you have, when you have a browser engine that actually renders the CSS and, you know, the actual website, it's really easy to determine which fields are used for which purpose. And the, th the three fingerprintable elements of access control on the web is um, the first one is there are two visible text fields. The second one is the web tries to protect you from the guy behind you who wants to see your password on your screen. And the fingerprint the fingerprintable element is the, is, is the type of the input field. It's password. So that's an easy one. And so, so when the scanner actually found a web form with a password field, the only thing missing is to find the text field that is used for the username. And um, actually that's pretty simple, but um, as I said, it all comes down to reliability and so I came up with a third fingerprint, actually geometry, because um, 
when you look at all those um, login forms on the web, you will recognize that um, the companies try to make the websites look nice. And um, to do that, the text fields are parallel. And um, that's more or less always the case. So even if the first and the, th and the second fingerprint fails, that one is still pretty reliable. So in the end, um, we have a login function. And the, the, the um, useful thing about the login function is that it is, is provided by the web browser itself. So when you build a vulnerability scanner, you don't have to care about finding some login forms, building some HTTP requests, but you, you can simply call that function. And I built a lot of functions for different purposes. For example, um, you know, the search function of a website, the logout function of a website. You can check if you're still logged in and all that stuff. So with that, um, it is really easy to penetration test internal parts of websites and open source apps and that's not given because it has been a problem for a long time and I think a lot of zero day exploits for a lot of web applications are there and are still being released every day because it was difficult to, to um, scan them in a automated way and that's really easy now and um, yeah so that's actually the first demo that I want to show, that whole login process, because it is kind of useful. And um, to actually prove that the scanner is able to log in uh, and that it has a browser engine included, the scanner will make a screenshot as soon as, as it is logged in. And yeah. So that's what I'm going to show. Um, so. I don't really have a name for the scanner. I call it 360. Um, yeah, that's that's the current name. It will be released on GitHub today. So, for example, let's let's use a um, website that is known for its um, complicated JavaScripting. Facebook. We could also use Twitter or um, whatever, but. Um, that's how the source code of the Facebook website looks like. As you can see, there's really a lot of nasty stuff in there and um, you, you really need to be able to execute JavaScript to, to handle that website in an automated way. So um, I'll show the login process. I created a, a test account. That's the password. I kind of have to show that, but yeah. So we scan facebook.com. The username is defcon20x. The password is here. And the scan started. That's, that's some um, QT internal stuff. You know, um, the, the site gets actually rendered, so there are some changes applied to the fonts. Uh, the more important thing is the login seems to be finished and a screenshot has been created. And as soon as I started my Nginx here, can actually see it. Yep. Looks like that. The login failed. That's interesting, but um, not important for the demo. Yep. On which form? Because we have three fingerprints for a login. Um, do you know any web login on the web that requires you to enter a two password? Well, which password field do you think is the password? Is the first one? 
yeah, um, that, that's actually where. Can I come back to that in a minute? I just want to show the successful login. But it's a great question, of course. Um, so let me just um, show the login. I think I just forgot the, the Gmail part of the mail address. Here we go. Logging in. Ready. Okay. So we're locked in, but uh, I uh, the actual reason why I said it was not um, important that the login failed was because the scanner tried to log in by just and I proved that with the source code now. That's the source code of, of that example script. I simply get the browser object. Sorry for the noise. Um, I simply get the browser object, I simply get the username and password from the command line and simply call that function. And I'll walk you through the different functions afterwards if you want to, but there is no, um, you know, there are no, I did not prepare the scanner to log into Facebook and um, I'm going to prove that afterwards. But to come back to your question, uh, your question was there are two, um, different forms on that website. And um thanks. Yeah, um the cool thing about web forms is form is a specific HTML tag. So you have you know a, a um HTML form in a uh HTML document looks like that starts with the form tag and ends with the form tag. And in one form tag are specific input elements. And um, if, if you want to submit a, a logem form, you can, uh, you know, um, usually you only submit the input fields in, a log in one, you know, form tag. And um, in a login form, there are specific, um, the specific data required. One, the username, one, the password. And in a re registration form, which is another function of the scanner, by the way, dot register to, to sign up, um, there are different um, elements required. And um, I showed those um, three different uh, fingerprints a couple of minutes ago. Um, these ones. It is actually really easy to, to tell those different um, forms apart because um, it is a problem, of course. There are password fields in a re registration form as well, but usually there are fingerprints to detect that as well. And the easiest fingerprint is there are more than two visible text fields required to, re to register on a website. For example, birth date or, or email address or, you know, that stuff. And um, the scanner simply fingerprints the actual login form on Facebook by, you know, just two input fields, one password, one username. Yeah. Uh, I can show some more demos for Logent on Twitter, on Google Plus, on pix.defcon.org. If, I don't know, if you want to see that. Doesn't seem so. Yeah? Okay. Uh, okay. So I don't have I don't have an account for pix.defcon.org, but we'll see if the login would work. If you have a random website in your mind that has a really complicated login scheme, we can try that as well. So just as a proof that I did not, you know, prepare it. But 
okay, the pix.defcon.org one is finished. Looks like that. Invalid login. That's good news because I, you know, the account is not valid and this can I at least try to log in. Uh, I'll try uh, Twitter now. Or Google Plus, and um, as you know, Google is known for its really specific, really cool WebKit hacks. So I don't want to be the guy who builds a web scanner based on HTTP and HTML parsing uh, that has to, you know, parse uh, Google JavaScript. So that one is finished as well. Seems to work. Good. Um, cool. So, yeah, and the sec folded, but um, I'm going to talk about that later. So, um, that was authentication. And um, the other demos that I wanted to show are all about, um, you know, I, I built a little um, PHP test app with very, um, Common vulnerabilities as a fast CGI beyond that Nginx setup. Looks like that. Um, uh, there's some JavaScript in that. For example, this link here redirects um, through two different kinds of redirections. One is um, HTTP header based, the other one comes with a delay of one second and is fired by JavaScript. And uh, regular crawlers used to break with some sort of redirection of that kind because um, they're simply not supposed to, to handle it just by parsing HTML and that stuff. So uh, let me show that one as well really quickly. Um, for example, there is a uh, there's a SQL I slash cross scripting slash whatever here, but um, that's not the important part. We have tools to exploit XSS with a delay of a couple of days. Uh, we have tools to exploit SQL injections, local file inclusions, and whatever. Uh, the important thing about this talk is the detection of the fuzzable elements of the website. And um, this fuzzable element, the foo.php, is not easy to find for a crawler. It's not that difficult, but it's, it's not that easy as well. And this is the source code. The, the link is simply blah.html. And as I said, it simply redirects to foo.php with some weird JavaScript slash header stuff. And I'm not going to tell the scanner about the foo.php, but just about localhost. And we'll see if it is able to find the um, vulnerable file. Yeah, the, the problem with that stuff is the capture. It's not, it's not to detect the login field because the heuristic still succeeds. There's a username and a password. The difficulty is the capture and we have some capture solving approaches. I think one guy um, hacked the, the Google capture, the Google audio capture a couple of weeks ago, which was pretty cool. But the problem about that is not about detecting the login form but about breaking the capture. And um, I have an approach for that as well. I'm going to talk about ab that a little bit later. But um, yeah, great question as well. By the way, um, the Google capture can be simply bypassed by ignoring it. Um, I'm going to demonstrate that uh, in a couple of uh, seconds. So yeah, um, the scanner found the wait a second foo.php and you know, um, posted some kind of a unique XSS string to, you know, detect a reflective XSS. Really boring. As I said, 
this talk is not about exploiting vulnerabilities. I could have written some more cool demos, a, you know, a OS, OS commanding vulnerability and uh, pushed in a reverse shell there and metasploited it and exploited the kernel and I don't know. But this talk is really not about exploiting vulnerabilities but about getting to the point where you can exploit the vulnerability because it is really simple to exploit the kernel and install a rootkit in there once you're in. But the difficult part is to break the defense and to build the heuristic and once that is succeeded and w when you can start to uh, fire your hundred thousands of HTTP requests in there to, to you know, exploit the vulnerability. 99% of the work is done. Exploiting the vulnerability is really easy but um, working through all the JavaScript stuff at sites like Facebook or at, like at e-commerce systems, that's the really difficult part and so yeah, that's why I chose a really stupid example. I have a better example as well, a local file inclusion and a some stuff. I um, can't show all that but as I said, this is about discovery. And um, yeah, so if somebody knows a cool online um, scanner benchmarking site, I'll show some demos there as well. But um, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so that's how it works. Okay, good. So um, back to the slides for now. This is going to be about software architecture and about breaking captures and about doing the, um, yeah, telling re registration forms apart from login forms and why that works. And um, so um, this is not going to be about um, high level stuff anymore. So I'm actually going to show a lot of code now. So um, if you don't want to see a lot of code, um, there are more high level talks like the um, connect talk for example. Okay, um, so the um, actually um, the architecture of web scanners is actually always the same. Um, it's all about a core element. As I said, mostly the HTTP library and a HTML parser. Then there are a lot of plugins and the plugins can be files they can be stored in a database or they can be simply an array or a hash map. I don't know. And in those plugins, I'll show mine, my plugins. Um, for example, the injector plugins, you know, they, they describe local file inclusion vulnerabilities, OS commanding stuff, file upload, SQL. For example, the SQL plugin looks like that. Uh, um, there are some payloads and some, some ways to modify those payloads and different techniques to verify a vulnerability. And um, this plugin, as you can see, is really, really simple. It, there are simply a lot of arrays in it. That's it. And um, probably um, cool to mention about the SQL plugin are the different payloads because they are not that usual. For example, um, I mean, we all know the single quote payload. If, if we start penetration testing a website, um, we, we throw some single quotes in there and look what happens. That, that's how it starts. But um, there are a lot more things you can do to actually fingerprint the architecture behind the, the website. For example, if the website wants you to enter an integer, you can throw a zero in there. And if it if it acts normal, you can throw a minus zero in there. And um, yeah, so, so you can throw negative integers in there, really large integers. You can throw 10 megabytes of strings in there and look what happens. And this is exactly what this um, SQL plugin does, not for just fuzzing and generating error messages, but to fingerprint the SQL server behind the website because I recognized um, that the SQL servers break in different ways. For example, if you throw a hex uh, 255 uh, backslash xff in there, MySQL mostly says something like um, 
yeah, that's uh, not encodable by Unicode something foo, and um, this SQL statement fails. So if you throw a backslash xff in a website and the website responds with nothing, you can be pretty sure that that's a MySQL server. And um, yeah, so I wrote the documentation for all the payloads and the reasons for them and how to fingerprint them, but you know, um, it's, it's really nice to see that um, there's a lot of fingerprinting work that can be done with um, different payloads. S however, um, I was talking about the architecture of the scanner and um, as I said, there's a core, there are different plugins for injections for different types of applications, WordPress, Drupal, I don't know. Uh, wait a second. Um, yeah, there are some web shells to, to prove the exploit in the end um, for different languages, um, Perl, Python, and so on. And um, more important probably is the um, core element of the scanner and the browser object in it, which is simply um, based on PySight. PySight is a um, really cool framework that, how much time is left? How much, uh, uh, yeah. PySight is a really cool framework to, to um, use Qt libraries from Python and they did a great job doing that and there's actually an alternative for that. It's called PyQt4 but PySight is much more stable but as you have seen a couple of minutes ago not that stable. It's still Zach Fault a couple of times. Uh, I don't know why. I, I tried to, to S trace it and to, to core dump it but it's really some complicated stuff to make uh, C++ and, and Python work together well on the web um, side. So um, yeah. So um, there has actually been done some work for that stuff before. It's called a, a project called Spinner. They used that um, PyQt4 um, framework, and they built a, a web browser in Python and a, a, a stateful web browser. And I really tried to to adopt a lot of these um, features. For example, the, the snapshot feature to create nice screenshots. And um, to use proxies and all that stuff, but um, the really important elements that I changed are the patches to WebKit itself, um, to the C++ code of QWebKit. So um, a, a really difficult um, element of web scanning is JavaScript, and not just to execute the JavaScript, but there are events in JavaScript. For example, you know them from all kinds of apps, on mouse over on key press, on focus, and I don't know, and um, if you want to crawl and, and spider all the fuzzable locations of a website, you have to execute all these events. And um, I tried to do that from Python and I failed. So, so I patched WebKit and created a function in WebKit that would fire all these, um, you know, event listeners for me because I, I looked for a function that not just let me trigger a, a event listener on a web element but list me all the event listeners that are listening on a web element and I learned that there is none. <laughs> I mean, uh, there was a specification for it a year ago or so but um, they never really implemented it. I think in Netscape six point something is a function for that but yeah, so um, it, it's, it's actually a really cool fact that we're not forced to use a original um, web browser engine in our scanner, but we can use our own one and uh, our JavaScript engine does not really have to do everything that the JavaScript of the, the, you know, the site that we are scanning wants us to do. It can also pull some callbacks in our scanner code, so, so it's really cool to have that kind of access. And um, another nice technical thing to mention is the fuzzable object. Um, this is something that the W3F author, I mean the idea is from the W3F obviously and I think it's a really cool idea. So um, 
what those guys did is they don't treat um, URLs and forms in specific ways, but they create objects and um, they fuss those objects. And that, that's really more stable than just replacing different parts of strings. And you know, it, it's really nice to handle that. It's, it's really nice to, to save fussable objects because when your scanner found a vulnerability, you can simply save that fussable object at the state of the fussable object and you have an exploit ready to use, ready to release. Because you know, um, when you found a serial exploit in, in WordPress for OS, OS commanding with that scanner or a scanner based on that structure, you can simply dump that fussable object and release it on somewhere and um, it's going to be really easy for you to, um, yeah. Okay. Fine. So I think there are some more slides left. Uh, this one is about further research and other um, improvements to, to the actual concept of not just building a TCP socket, throwing a um, HTTP request in there, getting a response and parsing the HTML, which obviously doesn't work in today's web anymore. But um, you know, taking a browser engine and modifying it and actually starting to scan the web, not just fuzzing HTTP. Because in the meantime, after the last 10 years, we know HTTP well enough. And we don't need to, to do all that stuff just to fuzz HTTP. So, yeah. So, so the further re research that I will do and that makes sense is. Um, to improve the binding between browser engines like Gecko, WebKit, or I'm not sure if it makes sense to use the Internet Explorer, but um, if you want, if someone wants to use it, that makes sense as well. Maybe not. Um, so the other thing is um, WebKit, of course. Um, maybe it makes sense to replace. WebKit and that approach by Gecko because um, actually Gecko of Firefox, I mean Gecko is the run engine of Firefox for, for those who are not that familiar with the um, web browser architecture stuff. Um, and Firefox and Gecko are in the end the more um, high quality projects because um, for those of you who are into exploits and browser exploits and browser vulnerabilities, um, you know that there is a remarkable amount of WebKit exploits um, released in short periods of time. And I'm not sure when the last Gecko exploit was actually released or when the last Gecko vulnerability was reported, but you know, there are not, there are not a lot of them out there, at least not public ones. So it's actually a good sign. Um, yeah, another idea is. Um, are you guys familiar with uh, the WolframAlpha.com engine? Some of you? It's just a, a mathematical approach to analyze, to calculate the web and I thought it may be a, a good approach to analyze and calculate error messages in the web because for example as we have seen when a, log when a login fails or when the scanner's heuristics failed and the may happen, I don't doubt that. And the website answers with something like, hey, um, you need to um, enter the verification password for your re registration. And the scanner actually wants to trigger a, a web login. The scanner can parse that error message, extract the important words, and learn from the error message. So, the next time you call the, log the login function, the scanner will know not that it should not use that form, but the other form, because you know the error message said that it was a reg uh, register sign up form. Um, yeah. So uh, the last and um, probably most weird. Um, thing that has to be fixed is the requirement to have a X server slash a virtual frame buffer. I used XVFP. Um, yeah, there's a requirement to have 
such a project installed um, to actually run the scanner that I'm going to release because you know WebKit actually wants to render the website and um, even if we don't want to see it except when we want to have a screenshot it needs a, a X server frame buffer backend to draw the website and I'm still not sure if it is necessary or not but um, it's, it's uh, not you know it's, it's not a good thing to uh, the need for a graphical environment on a command line based web scanner is just awkward so yeah. Uh, the content beyond this talk um, is going to be a framework for web scanning that has a browser engine included that has I don't know 2000 different plugins for different vulnerabilities and old WordPress exploits and you know Joomla and Drupal and all that stuff. There's going to be a mathematical engine to do some of that error message parsing. Um, there's going to be a Google Translate engine to translate every website to English even if the English is, is you know wrong and, and, and strange. It is still enough for the language parsing engine to analyze it. And um, yeah the WebKit patches are included as well. At the second component is the scanner itself as a proof of concept. Um, it's not as um, sophisticated as other scanners but it's enough for a proof of concept and um, I actually started to write a nasal script to include that into Nessus so that Nessus will be able to do some effective crawling in the future. More effective because right now as I said it's just HTML and um, yeah so uh, yeah so um, that's basically it. Yeah. <laughs>